Welcome to Inside Startup Investing, the only podcast where you can invest in every guest. On this episode, I will be speaking with Arthur Pierce, co-founder and CEO of WeClimate. WeClimate is a new online private market focused on providing access to retail investors into climate-focused investment opportunities. Some of the interesting highlights that stood out to me in this episode are, first off, I hadn't thought about the fact that most companies playing in the climate tech space today are still private companies. If you're an investor looking for exposure to the massive category that is climate technology, you have almost no way of doing so via public companies, hence the need for a platform like WeClimate. The second interesting thing I took away from my conversation with Arthur was how quickly competition is rising globally in the clean energy space thanks to policies like the Inflation Reduction Act, which is incentivizing a change in entrepreneurial behavior for those chasing the vast landscape that is new energy technologies. Lastly, I really appreciate the way We Climate is approaching sourcing deal flow for their platform. In fact, Arthur has been a VC for many years in the climate space and is aiming to get folks into the deals that he has seen come across his own desk, which should be exciting for any investor listening in. So with that, let's get on to the show and welcome Arthur. Arthur, let's jump right into it. What is We Climate and how did you come to found We Climate? So We Climate is a, a climate equity crowdfunding platform. And what we're trying to do is use uh, the existing tools that exist for traditional equity crowdfunding platforms like WeFunder and Start Engine and apply it specifically to, to climate. So I've been involved in the climate tech space for a while, mainly as a venture capitalist. And the thing that stood out to me was how fast the industry was growing over the past you know, 10, 10 years in particular. And as you know, it's an asset class that has been very limited to venture capitalists and to high net worth individuals. So I saw an opportunity to, I suppose, capitalize on two, two growth areas. The first is um, the growth of climate tech. And then the second um, is just the space itself, equity crowdfunding, in terms of how quickly um, it's been growing, particularly since the Jobs Act uh, came in, you know, 10 years ago or so ago. Do you think there's anything about climate technologies and, and just the category in general uh, that could compel investors to want to be more involved, to be investing in the category in a way where maybe, you know, across broader sectors, there may be less interest from investors in getting involved? Climate to this point, it has been a very much a difficult asset class to get involved in. And it's funny because most of the companies in the climate tech space, and I mean, I'm looking at it, you know, all day, every day as, as an investor in the climate space with VC funds um, and also with We Climate, it's very hard to get involved. And the private markets traditionally in, in relation to climate are where all the action is happening, right? So there's very few public companies in the in the climate tech space. Obviously, you have you know your Teslas and your BYDs and a few of these big players, but the vast majority of the companies are in the private space, and that's where we see all the action happening. And for people who want to get involved, it's a question of how. I think a lot of them to this point have struggled to find an outlet in terms of how can you actually project yourself rather than just you know eating meat how can you actually put your money to work you know for most people in uh, that are you know in the gen z or the millennials climate is their number one concern they want to get involved they want to do something but a lot of times they feel powerless and you know what we're trying to do is just give them an outlet you know whatever that may be if they want to invest you know, $100 or something smaller than that even, we're putting the power in their hands so that they feel like they can actually have, you know, access to both the impact upside of, of the climate, but also the financial upside as well. So it's a bit of both. For those who, who aren't as in tune to kind of the climate sector, how do you define climate? What type of companies fall into that bucket? Climate is everything. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's every industry, I think. If you're to if you're to go back, you know, 2000 and, you know, 2007, 2008, 15 years ago, climate was a very narrow area. It was up and coming technologies like wind, like solar, um, and now you know it's everything. It's agriculture, it's energy, it's industry, it's cement, uh, it's land use. It goes across. It's transport. It goes across every area. I mean, climate touches absolutely all aspects of the economy. 
any area that is dependent on petroleum or fossil fuels for uh, for energy uh, is essentially an area whereby you could replace it with a cleaner technology, uh, you know, in, in the climate space. I love that. A so what we're getting at here is it's quite a broad, large, and massive category to be able to go after. From your perspective, what are some of the exciting kind of key sectors that you're looking at, and how are you deal sourcing right now for the platform? Yeah, so I think, you know, if you, if you look back, a lot of the technologies that have done really well, you know, over the last, let's say, five to ten years are now proven technologies, like I mentioned, like wind and solar. Um and now there's just a whole plethora of companies that are doing exciting things, whether that's battery technology, whether that's storage, you know, whether it's um, alternative protein, food. You know, there's so many companies in the space right now that it's hard to narrow down and, and choose, you know, one specific area. But what I will say is, you know, there's a lot of opportunities uh, or opportunity, particularly you know, the the skill set and the climate set that we need isn't fully there just yet. I think we have a, a pathway with wind and with solar in terms of what they can deliver. But, you know, we still don't have that technology set that could get us to, to net zero by, say, 2030 or 2050, whatever way you look at it. So it's really, for entrepreneurs, I think it's a really exciting time to be looking at building in climate simply because there's such an appetite from you know, investors from CBCs, from corporates, from, you know, small companies, family offices, whatever it is, everyday people to, to get involved and start both using technology and building technology in the climate space. So uh, to answer your question, you know, to name one type of technology is, is quite difficult, but I'd be happy to, to dive in into specifics if that's what you'd like. Well, I, I am interested to hear from you. You know, recently there's been a lot of news coming out that um, even the big car companies, right, they were kind of on full adoption mode getting into EVs, and then now there's been a bit of pushback where they're going, it's either A, not as profitable, or B, they're just not seeing folks actually purchasing these vehicles, um, which is hampering their profit. So now there's a little bit of shying away from the category. I'd love to understand, you know, you're in this space. Tell us more about your viewpoints and thoughts on that. Yeah, so it's funny. I mean, it, it happens on both. It's two different stories on two different sides of the pond, I would say. And American media is, you know, very heavy in terms of their how they control the narrative, and particularly in relation to, to EVs. Um, I think what you're probably getting, uh, you've seen some of the rental companies like Hertz pull back. Uh, they had a, a big fleet of, of electric cars, and they've since pulled back and gone back to, to using fossil fuel cars. Now... It, that particular vertical, I mean, I think electric cars, I read Nat, uh, Nat Bullard, um, he puts together a, a deck every year in terms of what's happening in the climate tech space. And what was quite interest, interesting to me, even in the US, if you look at the adoption rates of electric vehicles in the US in terms of ownership, it's like 2023 was just another record-breaking year. Mm -hmm. So if you actually look very much at a granular level and say okay what's actually happening on the ground don't just control the narrative and these media stories that cut co that come in from business insider or whoever it might be saying you know people don't want to use uh, electric vehicles or electric vehicles are worse to the planet than fossil fuels etc etc i think this is natural it's going to happen on the adoption curve there's going to be hiccups all you know along the way you know at this point in time, generally, once you get to around 5% adoption of a new technology, you know, it's pretty much inevitable that you're going to get to 100%. And EVs right now is far surpassing that. I mean, I think mm. most people still at this point in time, they still have a little bit of range. I think range anxiety is probably the biggest thing that people have. I don't have an electric car just yet. And a lot of it is simply because the, the infrastructure, I mean, I'm living here in Ireland and the infrastructure just isn't here in uh, in Ireland just yet. And in the in the building that I live for me to charge uh, the EV or to charge an EV. So I think there's a number of things that need to catch up. Uh, infrastructure is, is one, but, you know, it's an inevitable cycle. And there, like an EV is simply a better car. 
right now. I mean, if you look at the companies that are building like the Tesla, you know, the Model 3, and you look at Neo, and you look at Xpeng, and you look at BYD, they're just building better cars than a lot of the large traditional automakers at this point in time. So if you're going to offer someone a better product, they're probably going to use it. Now to move on to, you know, the, the wind and solar sector, for instance, right? A another area that's really interesting to me, um, it seems as though more and more of the grid is getting onboarded to, to wind and solar technologies. Um, but there is a lot of talk about the fact of, you know, can wind and solar actually support the grid? And there are complexities to bringing those power sources on that have a little bit less predictability as to just, you know, general uh, production using fossil fuels and things like that. Um, what are your thoughts on that topic? I'd love to hear that. As we know, they're both intermittent technologies. I don't know. I'm not sure the uh, the precise efficiency of solar. I think it would probably depend. It's probably in around 20%. You can you can use solar, and I'm sure wind is probably a bit higher. It's probably around 30%. So they're not going to provide that base load power that you get with fossil fuels, that you get with, um, let's say, coal, that you get with natural gas, that you can just switch on when the, when the grid is under pressure. Um, Nuclear obviously can provide that base load power, but unfortunately, you know, it's a bit of an enigma and um, I don't just, it, it's a very complicated and, and sensitive topic that's probably not worth getting, getting into uh, on this podcast. But if you think of the bigger picture in terms of how do we, <clears throat> how do we complement wind and solar technology so that we when the grid is under pressure, we can use, um, you know, we, we don't have to draw on coal. And what you're seeing is you're seeing a lot of companies coming through that are building things like virtual power plants, which I think are incredibly um, interesting. And there's a huge, you know, plethora of companies that are emerging in what I would call the flexibility space, whereby they're, they're trying to provide flexibility onto the grid through things like demand response, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, everyone recognizes the issue and it's been obvious for you know a number of years that we still need that you know base load power uh when when the when the grid's under pressure it will be solved will probably be solved through a mix of you know flexibility solutions like virtual power plants and demand response um and it will probably you know also just take a, a little bit more in the line of consumer uh, consumer behavior, like we're gonna have to change our patterns, you know, and I think this is just the reality of the of the situation, you know. Um, consumer behavior is gonna have to have to change and have to adopt. And I think for companies that are in this space, if you can incentivize consumers to to change their behavior, um, you know, they're going to be in a really good space. I forget if it's been about a year or maybe a little bit more since the infrastructure bill was passed, um, and which is supposed to provide quite a bit of funding. And I think part of, part of that infrastructure spend is to go to kind of clean technology uh, infrastructure projects. Have you seen any, you know, we talked about incentivizing the consumer. Have you seen the incentives from the government to fund projects leading to more development and, you know, more solar projects, more wind projects, things of that nature? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the Inflation Reduction Act, which which Biden passed, look, Biden obviously gets a lot of uh, bad publicity. Uh, I'm not going to go into the politics of it, but he's been great with, you know, in terms of climate. You know, I think he committed something like 370 billion initially to um, subsidies, uh, you know, at a federal level, which is which is great. And I think what what that has really done is it's created competition and uh, not just in you know in the US but also in Europe because we're looking at it going okay here's what you know I'm a European company and I'm selling electric vehicles here are the subsidies that consumers get in Europe here are the subsidies that uh, consumers get in the US if it's higher in the US there's more competition governments then feel obliged to to put their own incentives in place and I think uh, you know this kind of copycat uh, you know, this copycat type uh, legislation works, particularly for climate. And, you know, at this point in time, from what I've seen on the ground, you know, whether it's electric tractors, whether it's, um, you know, you want to, to buy an electric bike or you want to buy an electric car or you're thinking about uh, buying a heat pump or whatever it might be, 
The grant is there. Through the IRA, the government is there to help. The only issue that I can see with it is that consumers at this point in time don't know how to find the grant. And mm-hmm. there's a ton of paperwork uh, that needs to needs to be filled out. And there's often a lead time between, okay, I'm applying for the grant, I want my heat pump now, and then you've got to wait, you know, six, nine, 12 months, whatever it is for the, for the grant money to come through. So I think what's going to get better is, you know, the money is there and the grants and the subsidies are there what's going to improve next is the speed of allocation and you know the, the way that the, the the act can actually get the money into the hands of the consumer um you know very quickly i think that's going to be the big change that we're going to see with it love that let's dive back into to we climate so talk to me about when you guys got started the deals that you're bringing to the platform um are there any available deals right now that folks can invest in yeah, so, uh, you know, we went through the, the normal hurdles that you have to get through in order to get a license um, with, with FINRA. So it takes a, you know, it takes a bit of time. Um, and, you know, I'm based here in Ireland as well. So being based overseas, it just takes, it took us, you know, the guts of a year to get a approval for the license. And, you know, you needed a bit of patience with that. And, you know, but on top of that, we were building the platform at the same time. So we were able to do both things in unison. And since we got the Reg CF license towards the end um, of last year, you know, we've been building um, the platform, I'm not going to say slowly, but at our own pace. And the main thing for me has been, you know, keeping the, the burn down pretty low. You know, I'm bootstrapping the company. When you're bootstrapping a company, you know, you keep your eye on, on costs uh, at all times. So for us, you know, what we're re- really trying to do is... Uh, in the position I'm in, I see a lot of deals in climate, so I'm quite fortunate in terms of deal flow. And you know, for marketplaces, generally, there's a chicken and egg problem that you have to solve. Generally, one side of the marketplace is constrained. In our case, the issue that we face and the issue that we're trying to scale up is just getting more eyeballs onto the platform. I don't want to go down the route of spending a ton of money on paid marketing and Facebook. Um, so we've tried to do things organically through partnerships, through content, um, just through our own network. Uh, the companies that we have, uh, you know, brought onto the platform, we have two companies that have, um, that we've onboarded so far that are testing the waters. One is a virtual, uh, power plant company called, uh, Therma. And, you know, you can check out that on weclimate.co. And then the other is a, is a company called Myro, which is also um, testing testing the waters on our, on our platform. In the climate space, I feel like it actually lends itself really well. You know, there are technology plays where they need a lot of equity investment to build new technologies like a virtual power plant. And then there's kind of the infrastructure plays, which is just we need more windmills, right? We need more solar panels. Yep. Um, and there's those companies that are looking to just serve it more so in those segments. And debt can work really well for those spaces. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And do you think about offering both equity and debt type investments on these platforms? Yeah, so, you know, traditionally what you see, climate, it, you know, a lot of the, the companies are just hardware intensive. That's just the nature of the game. That's the nature of the asset class. Um, it requires a lot of capital. Uh, fair enough, the cost of capital has been, you know, on a on a downward curve, uh, thankfully, and it's now, you know, probably ten times cheaper than it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago to, to build a company. So, that's you know, very positive. I suppose kind of similar to you know what it was like with the first internet era. Your 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 costs were you know putting data servers, uh, or putting servers you know on the roof, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You know there was a, a huge upfront cost associated with that, and now that cost is you know with AWS and that has has gone you know down dramatically. And the same thing has happened in climate. The the hardware costs have gone down um, dramatically, but at the same time, what you see is companies. You know that 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 are, that are hardware intensive. Generally speaking, if they're raising an equity round, you will see that they're probably trying to raise a debt round um, in unison with that, or to complement the, the the equity round that they have. So most of them will go to you know traditional VCs um, on the equity front, and then maybe they'll go to a bank or they'll go to a debt fund or whatever it might be so that they have a debt line that they can that they can draw down from from our end you know the debt world isn't something that 
me that I've ever focused on or that I'm going to pretend that I, I know as well as the equity world. Um, so I haven't, and We Climate hasn't to this point decided you know, to focus on the debt piece simply because it's not an asset class that I personally understand as well as I do the equity piece. So I'm trying to play to my, you know, play to our own strengths here a little bit. On the equity piece, I think it's really important that people get that upside potential that you get with, with equity investing. Then obviously, you know, the returns can be nice, but they're obviously a lot less. And I think with interest rates rising uh, the way they have been, you know, over the last three or four years, it's now a very appetizing uh, asset class, but it's also, you know, a complicated asset class. So, you know, is it something that we would do uh, at some point in the future? Probably, but right now, you know, we're just gonna stick to, to what we know best, which is the equity piece and finding great companies and bringing them onto the platform. You mentioned that uh, a lot of these companies are very hardware focused in the climate space. Historically, venture capitalists have been pretty, um, uncomfortable or not wanting to get involved with hardware businesses, right? Because they're harder to scale. So do you think there is a market gap for capital for climate-based companies because they tend to be hardware intensive and venture capitalists stay away from it? Or are you seeing more venture capitalists enter the space? You're definitely seeing a lot more traditional VCs entering the space because it's, because it is a uh, ven- uh, very energy in, or very capital intensive. It turns off a lot of generous investors simply because the payback period is longer. So it, it, it requires patient capital. You know, if you look at a traditional fund, they're probably looking at, let's say, five to seven year payback period. Whereas I would say if you're, you know, trying to build a small modular nuclear reactor and yeah, and, you know, there's a hardware cost, there's a regulatory cost, operational cost. It's probably going to take, you know, 10 years for something like that versus a traditional software uh, business. So what you need you need a different investor profile um, that can say, right, I'm obviously looking for a financial return, but as I alluded to earlier, I'm also looking for an impact return. And if you're looking for an impact return, your timelines and your, your investing horizon is usually longer. It's it's a seven to 10 years, generally speaking, is, is what I see with a lot of the impact funds in the space, is that they're willing to be a little bit more patient. It will change over time. You know, it's still at the very early stages of, of where we are in terms of the cycle. This is the f- kind of the first iteration of, you know, the impact uh, capital um, and the climate tech space, you know, since it's be- been uh, rebranded from clean tech, I would say. So, you know, the, the future uh, iterations are just going to keep looking better and better. And I think the the time and the returns horizons will keep coming down as well, um, just like we've seen with solar and wind. Well, one other thing I, I'd love to mention is, yes, it's an impact investment when you're investing in this category, but I mean, energy alone, right, is probably one of the largest categories globally uh, from a market opportunity perspective. I mean, just think about some of the largest companies in the world, right, Exxon Mo- Mobil, Aramco, um, these are massive, massive companies because they kind of own the energy sector. Imagine those companies being reinvented, right, with clean technologies. Like it or not, we're going to have to move to that world over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, so for me, it's both such an exciting impact opportunity to you know, make the world a better place, but also there's an endlessly massive market opportunity to go after for investment upside. So I, I think there's a nice blend there in this category. Last question for you here. For those who are interested, um, where should they go? What should they do to get involved with We Climate and start making investments in this sector? First thing, you know, we funnel through traffic in, in a couple of different areas. One is the Substack, where we put out very regular content around technologies that we feel are very interesting in the in the climate space. Um, so, you know, feel free to you know to have a look there. It's a free uh, free Substack. We re- recently put out a piece on enteric methane from from cows you know we need to set we need to solve the cow burps and cow farts problem so uh that's our most recent piece and i would encourage uh you know potential investors to start there and also you can just come on to the platform we um and you can register on the platform um everything is you know the platform is built it's ready to to rock and roll or you know you can reach out to me directly as well i'd be happy to, to have a conversation particularly if you're building in the space you know right now we can only work with us companies uh, but if you're building in the climate uh, space you know feel free to uh, to reach out to me directly 
terrific, Arthur. Thank you so much uh, for your thoughtful answers today. And thank you, as always, to our listeners. Have a wonderful day.